हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वाचिंग वांटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Are America and Iran going to war? Joe Biden has issued orders America will target multiple Iranian proxy groups in West Asia. Iran says it doesn't want a war, but it won't run away from one. The rhetoric is dangerous. The US president does not want to appear soft on Iran in an election year. But is this a fire that he wants to light? And what is the end game? On Vantage tonight we'll bring you the full story. Meanwhile, the India US drone deal is on track. The State Department has green-lighted it. We'll tell you what was the roadblock and why Washington is keen to overcome it. In Pakistan, a jailed and disqualified Imran Khan is campaigning through TikTok and AI. The election is next week. In India, a Congress MP is talking about a separate nation for southern states. An exclusive interview with Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman a day after the budget. In China, a top banker faces Xi Jinping's wrath as the crackdown on financial companies intensifies. The big breakup in Formula 1, while Lewis Hamilton has ditched Mercedes for Ferrari. Why the world doesn't care about the war in Sudan, how thousands of cattle are caught in the Red Sea crisis, what explains our love for absurd food, and do we have a plan to save the earth if a big asteroid strikes? All this and more coming up. The headlines first. 40,000 people in Ukraine without power after Russian drone attack. Kiev says two dozen drones were fired. They targeted Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Moscow has also accused Kiev of carrying out drone attacks on its territory. An angry Belgium summons the Israeli ambassador after bombing the country's development agency, the bombing of the country's development agency in Gaza. No employees were present in the building when it was struck. Brussels says destroying civilian infrastructure violates international law. In Kenya, a massive gas explosion kills at least 3 and injures more than 250. The fire burned several homes and cars in the capital Nairobi. The blaze was brought under control after more than 9 hours. The cause of the blast has not been revealed yet. Relief for Malaysia's former Prime Minister Najib Razak, his jail term has been halved to 6 years. In 2022, Najib was sentenced for misuse of public money. The pardons board gave no reason for today's decision. Najib will be released from jail in 2028. Good news for Indians traveling to see the Eiffel Tower in Paris. You can now purchase your tickets in rupees. France becomes the first European country to accept India's UPI Unified Payments Interface. Indians are the second highest international visitors to the Eiffel Tower. And Hong Kong quits from the E Asian Cup in Qatar because the event could not show China in the team name. While Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China, in international sports it competes separately, but it is required to include China in official names. The conflict in West Asia is taking a dangerous turn. This is no longer a proxy battle america is making preparations for direct military intervention the biden administration has issued orders in the coming days us troops will strike a range of iranian targets in two countries syria and iraq and washington admits that this is a dangerous moment so this is a dangerous moment in the middle east we will continue to work to avoid a wider conflict in the region but we will take all necessary actions to defend the united states our interest and our people and we will respond when we choose where we choose and how we choose they know it is dangerous they know it could lead to a new bigger war but america is going ahead anyway so what is this operation going to be like the us has not revealed the specifics or the scale and scope of it all that we know right now is this they will strike multiple targets over a number of days and what are these targets facilities and personnel linked to iran these could be militia forces groups that are funded armed and trained by iran's revolutionary guard force and will the us put any boots on the ground 
Well, they already have troops in the region, but it's unlikely that they'll mobilize forces for this operation, at least not immediately. And when do they plan to strike? Reports say a lot depends on the weather. They want clear skies for better visibility to avoid striking civilians. So safe to assume that drones could be deployed for this operation. But why does the U.S. feel the need to conduct an operation like this? To avenge the death of their soldiers. On Sunday, there was an attack. An American outpost was targeted in Jordan. It, was, it is called Tower 22. It's a logistics hub in Jordan, close to the borders with Iraq and Syria. There are about 350 U.S. officers there. On Sunday, they were struck by a drone. Three American soldiers died, another 34 were wounded. So it was a major strike, and it has put pressure on Joe Biden. He is facing demands to deliver a strong retaliatory response against what they call radical groups backed by Iran. In fact, they're after a specific group. Listen to this. We believe that the... Uh uh, the attack uh, in Jordan was uh, was uh, planned, resourced, and facilitated by an umbrella group called the Islamic Resistance in Iraq. The Islamic Resistance of Iraq, that's the group the Americans are after. It is an umbrella group covering all Iran-backed militias in Iraq. But they aren't the only ones attacking American troops. Since October last year, U.S. forces have faced multiple attacks in the region. In Syria and Iraq alone, U.S. bases have been targeted 160 times. They're battling what's called the Axis of Resistance. It's a military alliance built by Iran to push back against Americans and Israelis. Now, there's a large network of militia spread out across this region in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, and Yemen. Right now, this entire region is a hotspot. Missiles have been raining here. Since October last year, the U.S. has struck three countries, Yemen, Syria, and Iraq. And how many strikes in all? At least 61. These strikes were supposed to be for deterrence. They wanted Iranian proxies to stop targeting American troops. But the attacks continue, unabated. And where is Iran in all of this? Will it be sucked into this war? How much control does Iran have on these proxy groups, and can it stop their attacks? So far, the response from Tehran has been measured. Without alienating these groups, it is distancing itself from their actions. When American troops were attacked in Jordan, Iran was quick to declare that it did not order the strikes. And then again, Tehran reminded Washington that it was not looking for war. <laughs> The common chapter between you and us is that we know each other. You know that we do not leave any threats unanswered. While we are not looking for war, we are not afraid of war, and we do not run away from it. Now, the war may be coming to them. Tehran issued a warning today. It came from the president himself, Ibrahim Raisi. He said, and I quote, We have said many times that we will not be the initiator of any war. But if a country, a cruel force, wants to bully the Islamic Republic of Iran, we will respond firmly. That is a message to the United States. The attack in Jordan could be a turning point, really. America's political climate is dictating Biden's response. It is an election year for him. The president wants a second term. He cannot afford to appear soft on Iran, which explains the pace and direction of his response. Once U.S. forces fire those missiles, there is no turning back. The situation could spiral quickly. It could lead to an all-out clash between the U.S. and Iran. And speaking of politics dictating strategic responses, India's drone deal with the U.S. is back in the news. The U.S. State Department has given the green light. It is moving forward with India's request to purchase 31 drones, 31 MQ-9 Predator drones. The deal is worth $4 billion. Let's break it down for you. The Indian Navy will get 15 Predator drones. The Army and the Air Force will get eight drones each. These are long-range, high-altitude drones. They perform surveillance and attack roles. And that's not it. India will also get around 400 smart weapons including Hellfire missiles and guided bombs. It's part of the Predator drone package. The deal is now in its final stages. Only an approval from the U.S. Congress is pending. It should come in the next month, in the month of March. But why are we talking about it tonight? 
The intent of purchase was made last year during Prime Minister Modi's state visit to the US. So the deal should have been in the bag. But it wasn't. Reports say there were hurdles, political hurdles. And the, the deal was put on hold in December. The objection came from Senator Ben Cardin. He's a member of the Democratic Party, President Biden's party. And he put forward a condition. This is about Khalistanis in America, specifically about, specifically about one man, Gurpatwan Singh Pannu. Apparently, there was an assassination plot against him. And the U.S. says that India was involved. The physical death, we do not fear. Now, this senator and I'm going to wanted this case to be investigated. He said the drone deal should be cleared only after the investigation, only after a tough message has been sent to India over Khalistan. And remember, Pannu is a designated Khalistani the terrorist. He's now a U.S. citizen. He repeatedly threatens to carry, carry out terror attacks across India. He resides in America and he's been there for almost three decades. The U.S. has accused New Delhi of trying to assassinate him. They claim to have foiled the plot. India has dismissed all accusations, but Senator Cardin is perhaps not con convinced, hence the demand for an investigation. Now, when we look at bilateral ties between countries, when we look at defense deals or trade deals, here's what we should understand. All policy is affected by domestic politics. No leader wants to upset his or her voters, which is why Western leaders appease Khalistanis. It is dangerous, and we've said a lot about it in the past, but we cannot wish it away. So the best case scenario for India would be this, to work with partners and push them to act against anti-India groups, at the same time to ensure that they do not put a strain on bilateral ties, that they do not derail deals, and in this case, India has achieved that. The drone deal is on track. The U.S. needs it as much as India, if not more. After all, India is the biggest defense importer in the world, and America is the biggest supplier. For years, Washington has tried to break Russia's dominance in India in the defense market. This deal is a step in that direction. And the U.S. won't let political differences over a bona fide terrorist to come in the way. So I'll say that generally the U.S. defense, uh, India defense partnership has seen significant growth over the past decade. Um, this is a proposed sale that was announced during Prime Minister Modi's visit last year. Uh, we believe it offers significant potential to further advance strategic uh, technology cooperation with India and military cooperation in the region. The State Department calls it a significant matter. So they'll find a way to make it work. Such defense deals have political oversight. Multiple departments are involved. Several clearances have to be issued. That is the process. And New Delhi is patiently waiting as the wheels churn. Coming to the drone issue, uh, Sudhi and all our friends, see, this particular matter relates to the U.S. side. Uh, they have their internal processes in place, and we are respectful of that. India says it respects the internal processes of the U.S., a mature way to acknowledge government dealings. Perhaps there was never a political hurdle, just a small hiccup. Political differences are part and parcel of democracies, but India and the U.S. have more compelling points of convergence, and this deal is proof. Our next story comes from Pakistan. It has entered election week. Voting is on the 8th. Schools and universities have been shut for a week. Campaigning has intensified. The world already knows who will win. The army's chosen one. Only a miracle can prevent that from happening. But Imran Khan is not giving up. The former prime minister is in jail, and he's trying to make a backdoor entry. This is time to take time. What will Imran Khan do with Imran Khan? Imran Khan has given everything like that. I don't need anything.
This video is from TikTok. It was shared by Imran Khan's party, the PTI, Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf. That's the party. Imran Khan has at least 150 legal cases against him. He's got jail terms in two of them. He's been behind bars since August last year, disqualified from holding public office and banned from the airwaves. And yet, he has found a way to campaign through TikTok and artificial intelligence. In December, his AI clone was released. Imran Khan's team cloned his voice to make this video. आप सब शायद सोच रहे होंगे कि जेल में मेरा क्या हाल है। सबसे पहले मैं ये वाजह करना चाहता हूं कि पाकिस्तान की हकीकी आजादी की खातिर जेल में रहना मेरे लिए इबादत के मुतादिफ है। मैं अपने मुल्क और अपने लोगों के लिए अपनी जान कुर्बान करने को तैयार हूं। रियासती उदारों की जानिब से एक भगोड़ा के लिए समझौता किया जा रहा है। जब महुरी उदारे उस लाडले के लिए ताकतवर लोग तबाह कर देते हैं। लेकिन इस लाडले को मालूम होना चाहिए कि वे 8 फरवरी को इलेक्शन हार जाएगा क्योंकि आवाम की ताकत को कोई नहीं हरा सकता। it was a well choreographed stunt. Now as campaigning enters its final lap, they're doubling down, generating more AI speeches using notes from Imran Khan himself, which he sends through his lawyers. He sends these notes through his lawyers and his team turns them into campaign speeches. On Imran Khan's Facebook page, there is a virtual chatbot relaying information about candidates. And on X, the former prime minister has a new identity, prisoner number 804. That's the jail ID of Imran Khan. Full marks for ingenuity, we say, and for not giving up. Yet the odds are overwhelmingly against him. His party has lost its symbol, the bat. His party leaders are contesting as independents. So technically, even if Imran Khan wins some seats, he won't be in control. As independents, his party members could easily switch sides. There are no permanent partners in politics anyway. Plus, the military is openly tipping the scales in favor of Khan's rivals. They're leaving nothing to chance. Because despite their best efforts, Imran Khan remains a very popular leader in Pakistan. His internet campaign seems to have caught the eye of the army chief, General Asim Munir. He gave a statement a few days ago, a clear dig at Imran Khan. Let me quote from what he said. Governance cannot be performed virtually. It has to be performed on the ground. So do not make your decisions based on a six-inch mobile screen. General Munir calls social media vicious. His preferred candidate is Nawaz Sharif, back from exile, relieved of legal burdens and an on course to winning the election. Sharif is ramping up his campaign. He's asking Pakistanis to come out and vote in large numbers next week. Today, he made an appeal to the youth. <laughs> That's why Nawaz Sharif loves you. After a four year exile, Nawaz Sharif faced the face of his party again. He's leading every major rally in Pakistan. His election is a mere formality though. The real challenge begins after it, after he takes office. He has his work cut out. Pakistan is going through a grave economic crisis. They have a caretaker government in place right now. They're working on selling the state airline, the PIA, Pakistan International Airlines. It's their national carrier. The sale is almost done. Islamabad agreed to it last year when the IMF or International Monetary Fund bailed them out. The airline sale was one of the conditions that Pakistan agreed to. That's when they got the bailout. So the caretaker government will approve the plan and Sharif may have to see it through. Also, there is an IMF review due in March. So the next government will have to hit the ground running. They might as well do away with the sham election and get to work. From turbulence in the air to turmoil on the ground, there was pandemonium in the Rajya Sabha today. That's India's upper house of parliament. The chaos was over a remark made by a leader of the Congress party, India's main opposition party. Yesterday, like we told you, the union budget was presented in India, and this is how the Congress lawmaker reacted. The center is not allocating the rightful share of GST and direct taxes to South Indian states. There's a sense of injustice faced by the South Indian states. 
the funds collected from the southern states are being disproportionately redirected to north indian states if this pattern persists we might be compelled to seek the creation of a separate nation his name is dk suresh he is a member of parliament from karnataka in the lok sabha or the lower house of parliament and he is suggesting a break up of india a separate nation for the southern states of india why because he says there's fiscal injustice in the budget that the modi government has been unfair to the southern states and the allocation of funds and resources was not equitable now dk suresh is not just a a congress lawmaker apart from being the lok sabha mp from bangalore rural he also happens to be the brother of dk shivakumar who is the deputy chief minister of karnataka also the state congress president when asked to react to his brother backing a division of india dk shivakumar did what seasoned politicians do when they are cornered attempt a balancing act mr suresh or any other leader hk party or any other leader might have spoken that the pain of uh, south india see there should be a balance the entire country is one you can't only look at the hindi belt you have to look at the entire country so in this budget there is no equal distribution of financial sector though karnataka has been giving lot of revenue to the center and entire south india there is no major announcement which has been done so we all feel that we have been let down but as a party president the entire country is one we are indians there is no question india should be united the congress president though was more forthcoming his name is malikarjun khadge this is what he said if anyone speaks about breaking the country we will never tolerate it irrespective of whichever party they belong to malikarjun kharge will himself say that from kanyakumari to kashmir we are one and we will be one well he was trying to douse the flames given our painful history of partition talk of dividing india is callous and insensitive and with general elections fast approaching it is political harakiri the opposition has a serious foot in mouth problem and timing has never been their strong suit In the past their numerous personal jibes at Prime Minister Modi from Sonia Gandhi to Mani Shankar Iyer have all backfired so the Congress president's we are one statement was an attempt to stop the issue from snowballing but it was already too late here's how the government reacted need to address this question of whether this country can be divided even as a wishful thinking by a member members. of the Lok Sabha this is not an insignificant incident This is divisive thinking. It is an attack on our country as well as our constitution. It is an attack on India's unity. Meanwhile, D K Suresh has had a change of heart. He now says he is a proud Indian. But he is not the first leader to demand a separate nation for southern states. Politicians from neighboring Tamil Nadu have expressed similar sentiments. Before we get into more politics is a quick geography primer the southern part of india has five states karnataka where dk suresh is from telangana andhra pradesh tamil nadu and kerala there are also union territories the union territories of puducherry and lakshadweep now currently the bjp is not in power in any of these five states the bjp has traditionally dominated the hindu heartland of india a region closely aligned to its ideological leanings But under Prime Minister Modi, it has made inroads in South India as well. They were in power in Karnataka until last year. Also, the North-South divide is not just political. Often, it has been said, the South of the Vindhyas embraces rationality and modernity, while the North is subsumed by religious orthodoxy. But this is reductive at best. That's not to say there aren't cultural and religious differences, but India is a myriad stories of its diversity. and that has been our strength not our weakness look at rahul gandhi the de facto head of the congress party as we speak he is on his second bharat jodo yatra bharat jodo meaning uniting india he says he is on a mission to unite the country but it seems forget the public he can't even convince his own party leaders just before elections talk of dividing india a country that they want to come to power in is not a good look and that is putting it mildly and staying with india it has been a day since the interim budget was presented today finance minister nirmala sitaraman spoke exclusively to network 18's editor in chief rahul joshi about the budget about the focus on inclusive growth 
global ratings agencies and how they assess India, domestic politics and the north-south divide we just discussed, and a host of other issues. Here are some of the excerpts. Is there an attempt to paint the Bharti Janta Party as a North Indian party? And you know this uh, north-south north divide, encouraging that. Is that, is that, is that what you say? They've always called Bharti Janta Party two things. It is a Brahmin Baniya party. Yes. It's a Hindi party. <clears throat> Today, the kind of support BJP receives in South India disproves all this. And in, I don't want to name individuals and say, oh, he or she belongs to this caste. We've promoted this caste and therefore, more than BJP, I can challenge today, is there any one party in India which has worked for the betterment of tribals in India, which has worked for the betterment of the Dalit scheduled castes in India, which has recalled some of the best iconic leaders I want to ask, is there any one party in this country which has not, which has as much served as the BJP? So what is Hindi party? When, Parli when Prime Minister of India is talking about all languages, he quotes Thiruvalluvar. Yes. He talk, uh, quotes from Purana Nuru. Every given opportunity, he takes the languages even to the UN. So, Tamil Nadu's politics, speaking of these kind of things, has happily kept the Hindi-speaking parts of the country, even if they are in alliance with them. What is your message to the sovereign rating agencies? You're expecting an upgrade? Emerging market economy like India, despite the odds we are doing a lot of reforms, systemic reforms, which actually you're seeing is bearing the results now. If only Prime Minister Modi hadn't pressed the pedal, let's say the revving pedal, the accelerator um, during COVID, even as we are managing COVID, we will have to attend to reforms and continue doing the reforms. The Atmanirbhar Bharat announcements we're all infused with so much of reform measures. Otherwise, we wouldn't have eliminated more than 68,000 rules, which were just so archaic and were becoming instruments for rent-seeking people. That is why even in the budget, we have emphasized on transparency. We have emphasized on getting everything on board the budget process itself rather than keeping it out of, outside of the budget or underneath the cup. Do you think that 7% itself would be challenging? I mean, do you think it is realistic for us to grow on those lines? Upgrading our growth estimates is not just singularly our business. Yeah. People are seeing that fundamentally a lot of activities are happening. The robustness of the economy has not slackened anywhere. It has maintained its you know, the, the, the buoyancy with which things are happening, not just revenue collection when I'm talking of buoyancy. So there is reason to believe, yes, it is possible. And the deflator, not just the inflation, but the deflator itself uh, is constantly, meaning we are looking at controlling inflation, the other factors fall in place, so the deflator itself then plays a role and therefore, uh, we are confident that on the one hand we'll be able to manage inflation and on the other to keep the robustness in growth so that it is sustained growth. We have made every effort to look at both growth driving elements and inclusivity driving elements so that nobody is left out from this growth process. Now to China, where there are murmurs of another crackdown, and it has already claimed its first casualty. The name is Bao Fan. One of China's top billionaire bankers, he's the banker to the likes of Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu. Bao Fan was a heavy hitter in the tech industry, but for the last one year, he's been missing. 
Yes, the same old story. No one knew where he was or why he disappeared. But today, Bao suddenly resurfaced with an explosive announcement. He said he's stepping down from his own company. It's called China Renaissance Holdings. One of Bao's co-founders will step up and take over his duties. But why is Bao leaving? The official explanation is personal reasons. Let me quote from what they've said. For health reasons and to spend more time on his family affairs. That's from a company statement. Of course, there's more to the story. Last year in February, Bao vanished without a trace. Chinese authorities had detained him without giving a reason. No public statement from the investigators, no announcement of a probe, and of course, nothing on the charges against him. The entire affair was hush-hush. And this was no small matter because this company, China Renaissance, is a listed company. So its top executive cannot just disappear without cause. It's like someone like Elon Musk being taken away suddenly without explanation. No posts on X, no press conference, no public statement. How would the investors of Tesla and SpaceX react? There's bound to be panic. In China, Bao Fan was put in a similar situation. And sure enough, there was panic. The stock of his company tanked. It fell by 28% after the disappearance. But Chinese investigators were unrelenting. Bao Fan remained out of public eye for the rest of the year. The last update came in August 2023. A report said the investigation is still on and Bao is cooperating. Almost six months later, he says he's stepping down. So is the probe over? Is Bao Fan being forced to resign or is he doing it because he wants to? We don't have the answers, but we can see the pattern. Bao Fan is one of the many victims of a crackdown that is sweeping China's, in China's financial sector. Last year, more than 100 officials and executives were targeted, including bankers, investors and brokers. And like always, it's happening on the orders of Xi Jinping. Last month, he issued an ominous warning, and I'm quoting, power is concentrated, capital is intensive and resources are rich. There's no turning back, no relaxing and no mercy in fighting corruption. He said this to China's anti-corruption agency, singling out four industries, finance, energy, pharmaceuticals, and infrastructure. So Xi Jinping has embarked on yet another crusade, painting himself as the modern-day Robin Hood, fighting corruption, taking wealth from the rich, and giving it to the poor. This has been his playbook since 2013. Since he took office, he's purged tens of thousands of, of officials every time he senses a threat. He attacks people in the name of fighting corruption. He purges political rivals, real and perceived. He crushes potential threats. And it is in this series that China's financial sector is being hit. But why this sector? Because it has become a constant source of bad news. The Chinese economy is weak. The government is failing to revive it. So the Communist Party is intimidating the players, shifting the narrative. In December, China's top intelligence agency issued a statement. It asked citizens, to not be influenced by those who sought to, quote unquote, denigrate China's economy. The agency also vowed to, and I'm quoting, vowed to focus on strengthening economic propaganda and public opinion guidance. Since then, the Chinese state has targeted economists, financial analysts, and investment banks by censoring and intimidating them for their negative commentary. Xi Jinping has empowered his anti-corruption agency, but he is no Robin Hood. He is a bully, trying to force the financial sector into submission and in the process, driving away more investors from China. Our next story is about a breakup, not the kind you may be thinking about. Lewis Hamilton has parted ways with Mercedes. An era in motorsports is coming to an end. It also marks a new beginning. Hamilton will don red and race for Ferrari. Once fierce competitors, now one team. This is one of the biggest moves in F1 history and the timing is worth noting. Just last year, Lewis Hamilton extended his contract with Mercedes. Now he has switched. So was he unhappy with Mercedes? Is the shock move going to kill his career or will Hamilton top the podium with Team Ferrari? Here's the full story. When it comes to motorsports, two types of races have captured global attention. The first is MotoGP. It's a superbike race. The second 
is Formula One, better known as F1. It's the highest class of single-seater car racing. F1 was inaugurated in the year 1950. And there have been some racers that have made their mark in history books. The first is Aiton Senna, the racer who made the sport popular. Then there was another driver who became popular for his podium finishes. Michael Schumacher shot into the limelight as a racer for Ferrari. However, two years before hanging up his boots, Schumacher joined Mercedes. The news shocked the motor racing fraternity. Now Mercedes is at the receiving end. Their star racer is leaving. Lewis Hamilton will be joining Ferrari. It's one of the biggest moves in F1 history. For the uninitiated, Lewis Hamilton is a racer from England. The 39-year-old started his career in 2007. Hamilton's first love was McLaren racing. He stayed there for five years. Until it was time to move on. The big move came in the year 2013. That's when Hamilton decided to join Mercedes. Their partnership was one of the most successful ones in F1. Together, they racked up multiple podium finishes. A truly dream run. Team Hamilton and Mercedes set the racetrack on fire. Over a span of almost 10 years, they won the championship six times. Hamilton won 82 races at Mercedes. He had 142 podium finishes, meaning he finished in the top three. But in 2021, the dream run came to an abrupt end. Hamilton was not able to deliver like he used to. He was being outrun by the new kid on the block. Red Bull Racing's Max Verstappen has won the last three seasons. Hamilton has been dethroned. He has won since Verstappen showed up. And the pressure has piled on Mercedes. Despite the setbacks, Hamilton and Mercedes stuck together. In August last year, the racer extended his contract for another two years. But he has lost every race since signing on those dotted lines. And Hamilton was feeling the heat. It doesn't always work out to you the best, but with all this experience I have, I think I should be able to do a better job each year. So, um, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to get that, that championship. But the defeats kept mounting, resulting in a crack between Hamilton and Mercedes. The racer repeatedly spoke about being unhappy with his car. He prodded the engineers to give him a better machine. Nothing changed on the track. But off it, the disagreements grew. Now, the 10-year relationship is coming to an end. Hamilton will be seen in Ferrari's iconic red suit. The F1 world is shocked, but Hamilton's supporters are excited. Hamilton is a great pilot. In my opinion, he is very skilled and I think Ferrari also needs him. I would be a happier person than a Ferrari, you see, even though I am not from Ferrari. But Ferrari is an institution, right? And if a champion like him comes, it's a beautiful thing. Well, there you go. Hamilton's new avatar begins next year. He hasn't won a race in three years. Ferrari haven't won a title since 2008. Will a new car change Hamilton's fortunes? We will find out in 2025. Now to the war that the world has forgotten about, Sudan. It's been at war for 10 months, suffering a monumental humanitarian crisis. But Western powers or interests are not involved, so the world doesn't care very much. Sudan's story is getting worse by the day, though. Experts say the war is reaching a breaking point. It's my assessment that we are fast approaching a breaking point and that the conflict in Sudan demands your attention now more than ever. That was Kareem Khan, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. This week he briefed the United Nations Security Council. He said both sides are committing war crimes. And which are these two sides? The Sudanese army and a paramilitary force called RSF, Rapid Support Forces. They are the ones fighting, the army and the RSF. And this is not a fight for territory. This is a power struggle between two generals 
who command these forces, General Abdel Fateh Al Burhan, who leads the armed forces of Sudan, and General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, better known as Hemetti, who is in charge of the RSF. And where is, is the civilian leadership? They were ousted in a coup in 2021. These two generals worked together to pull off that coup. They were partners and friends. They promised to bring back the civilian regime. But when the time came for this transition, the generals went to war. They refused to make concessions or to let go of their power. So the fighting began in April last year. Ten months on, they're nowhere near finding common ground. At least 12,000 people have died. Nearly 8 million have been displayed, displaced. Over 1.5 million people have left the Sudan. They fled to neighboring countries like Chad, Ethiopia and South Sudan. There is a famine in the country. As of last year, 20 million people in the Sudan did not have enough food. Out of these, 6 million faced starvation. And now there are allegations of war crimes. Soldiers from both sides are said to have killed civilians, raped women and targeted different ethnic groups. The United Nations has issued an appeal to the international community. They need international help. They need burden sharing. And uh, unfortunately, the Sudanese refugee crisis, displacement crisis, humanitarian crisis is one of the least funded in the world. That's what it comes down to, money. Consider some numbers. Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022. So far, the West has mobilized some $230 billion in aid to Ukraine overall. $230 billion, including both military and humanitarian aid. That's what Ukraine has got. Every year, the U.S. gives $3.3 billion to Israel. Most of this is provided as grants, mainly to fund military purchases. When Israel went to war with Gaza, America promptly passed a new aid package worth $14 billion. Look at the kind of money they've given to Ukraine and Israel. But for Sudan, the United Nations sought $3 billion last year. Do you know how much they got? Less than one. Barely 19% of what they asked for. This gap exposes the world's apathy. Western-led institutions work for their interests. The media focuses on their challenges as countries like the Sudan keep unraveling and the so-called global powers behave like spectators. On January 5th, 16,000 livestock got on a ship. They embarked on a journey from Australia to Israel. Little did they know that this would be a journey worth bleating about. They're traveling through the Red Sea, which has been a conflict zone for more than a month now. Houthis based in Yemen have been attacking ships. We've been telling you about this. The crisis has hurt global trade, and now it has left thousands of sheep and cattle stranded. Concerns are mounting, all while the Australian government is lost at sea. Should they disembark the cattle, or should this journey continue? Our next report tells you more about this conundrum. On January 5th, the MV Bahija embarked on a journey. The ship didn't know it then, but this would prove to be a difficult journey. Not because of the passengers, of course. There was no bleating from them. After all, the ship was carrying 16,000 livestock, 14,000 sheep and 2,000 cattle. MV Bahija is an Israeli ship. It was homeward bound from Australia, where the livestock would have most likely ended up on Israeli plates. But that wasn't to be, because this was a journey through the Red Sea. The same Red Sea where Houthis from Yemen have been attacking ships. There have been retaliatory attacks as well. Global trade has been disrupted. The crisis has been going on for months now. And much like other ships making their way through the Red Sea, MV Bahija was affected. Due to the threat of attack, the ship initially diverted its route. Fifteen days later, a new plan was proposed to divert the vessel around Africa. Other ships have done the same to evade the Houthi attacks except it would have taken much longer for them to reach. So this idea was rejected. The ship was ordered home by the Australian government and since Monday it has sat off the Australian city of Perth. Nearly a month has passed. All 16,000 animals are still stuck aboard. 
in the sweltering summer heat. Now concern is mounting. Welfare groups are demanding release of the livestock. They have cited the risk of disease, physical and mental discomfort, saying the animals have been exposed to cumulative stress. These animals have already gone through 24 days at sea, potential heat stress, poor ventilation, standing in their own waste, they'd be extremely stressed. We've been asking state government, federal government, what the plan is. It appears at the moment there is no coherent plan. We would certainly hope there is very quickly. The Australian government has responded. It's trying to placate the animal lovers, telling them that the ship is being replenished with supplies and informing the public of veterinarian doctors being present on board. I recognise the strong public interest in this issue regarding the MV Bahija and I'd like to reassure everyone that we are working towards a resolution as quickly as possible. The situation is just as dire as it is amusing. For starters, the government shipped off animals through a conflict zone. Then they suggested an inefficient detour plan. So no points for creativity. On top of this, they haven't come up with another plan. So the livestock is stranded and the Australian government is completely lost at sea. They are clearly having a slow movement. Pardon the pun. For close to a month now. For our next story... Let me start with a flashback. The year was 1983. A man named Howard Schultz visited Milan. He was enchanted by the Italian city's espresso bars. He wanted to replicate the concept in his own country, America, and this idea gave birth to Starbucks. Today, it is the world's largest coffee house chain, and Schultz became its CEO. He retired last year, but not before unveiling his final creative act, a new coffee drink. You see, Schultz visited Italy again. This time he was inspired by the olive groves of Sicily. So he decided to infuse Starbucks coffee with extra virgin olive oil. Yes, olive oil in coffee. The drink is called Oliato. It debuted in Italy last year. This week it was introduced in America and Canada. Also London, Paris, Tokyo and Osaka. This drink is making a lot of buzz. It has an interesting concept and some do like it. But to many people... This is an olive twist no one asked for. It may as well be called a crappuccino. And we're not exaggerating. Some customers complained that the drink sent them straight to the bathroom. It gave them stomachache and diarrhea. Not just customers. The same happened to Starbucks employees. Many are calling it a laxative or a blasphemy. Experts put the, the concerns more politely though. Coffee leads to loose bowel movement. So does olive oil. Together, they can lead to laxative effects. Yet Starbucks is unfazed. But Oliato is not the only bizarre craze right now. Some people are, are believing in themselves like Starbucks believes in their coffee and they're not being picky because their meal of choice is deep fried toothpicks. These toothpicks are made from cornstarch or sweet potato. They're environment friendly. So they're widely available at restaurants, but they're not meant to be eaten. Yet South Koreans are frying and consuming them. Those with an evolved palate are adding a garnish of cheese. This has become a viral trend, racking up millions of views on social media. Now people across the world are giving it a try. The South Korean government is concerned, so much so that it has issued a health advisory. But that's the thing about bizarre food. Once you get a taste of it, giving up is tough apparently, which is why foods like these have been trending lately. Dirty soda, which is soda with milk, Fanta Maggi, chocolate biryani, Oreo pakora, and mango pani puri. These recipes can make you squirm. But some people claim to love them. Why is it that some foods can be fantastic to us while others are simply disgusting? Is it about differences in cultures or taste buds? Is everyone being too creative even when we wish they weren't? Well, according to science, it has everything to do with genes. You see, eating is the only thing we do that involves all our senses. What we eat has as much to do with smell and texture as it does with our taste buds. Every time we eat, a complex genetic map is at work. It sends signals to our brain, which decides our sensitivity to food, and by consequence, how we feel about the flavors, which is why pineapple on pizza 
is still a touchy topic. Two totally different tastes are at work here. The cheese leaves an undesirable fatty aftertaste, but the pineapple is acidic. It cuts through the greasy mouthfeel. To some, this is the perfect balance. To others, it is, well, disgustingly bipolar. Let me give you another example. French fries and ice cream. It sounds weird, but it is often a child's first culinary revelation. It works because the recipe is ice cream and starch, a historical relationship, often seen with cake and ice cream. And to some, the pairing makes logical sense. To others, it is a hate crime. That being said, the jury is still out on coffee with olive oil. But many bizarre pairings are based on scientific logic, something that TikTok tends to lack. So next time it tells you to fry toothpicks or douse chicken in cough syrup, do not intellectualize it. Just run in the opposite direction. Our last story tonight is about space. An asteroid is passing by. It's as big as the Empire State Building. NASA has termed the space rock, quote unquote, potentially hazardous. But do not worry, it is not going to hit us. Although the harmless flyby does make you wonder, what if it were to hit? Do we have a plan to keep the planet safe? You know what happened the last time an asteroid struck the Earth? Dinosaurs became extinct. Do humans have a plan for the next time something like this happens? Apparently we do. The United Nations has a branch called Office for Outer Space Affairs. It works to protect the Earth from meteor strikes. Several nations are part of this group and more want in. Our next report tells you about this anomaly in the space race. When you look up at the night sky, what do you see? Stars, planets, celestial bodies, but they all look the same, twinkles of light thousands and thousands of kilometers away. The only body that we can clearly see is our moon. It's also the only place in our solar system where we have sent humans. We're yet to go beyond that. Mars is next in line, but for now, we're Earthlings. We can't leave this planet. But that doesn't mean that we can't have visitors. In fact, we get more visitors than you can imagine. These are the floating rocks in space, better known as asteroids. Scientists say that every day, the Earth is bombarded with hundreds of asteroids. Most of these burn into dust as they enter the atmosphere. But some massive asteroids have made their craters on Earth. The biggest one happened millions of years ago. It wiped out dinosaurs and 70% of other species. Now, another big asteroid is passing by our planet. It's as big as the Empire State Building and NASA has called its trajectory potentially hazardous. But don't worry, it won't hit us. That makes us wonder, do we have a plan to defend the Earth from asteroids? Well, yes, we do. In fact, there's a layer of plans. The first is headed by the United Nations. They have a branch called the Office for Outer Space Affairs. At least 20 nations are a part of it, and more want in. They work together to send out warnings about asteroids that pose a threat. Sending warnings about asteroids is one thing. Protecting against impact is another thing altogether. American space agency NASA has been at it for years. They have set up a planetary defense system. It's called the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART. Yeah, so the spacecraft launched last November and it's been traveling out. It's, when it gets close to the asteroid, it'll switch to a, an automated navigation where it'll guide itself into the asteroid and impact the asteroid. The DART spacecraft is meant to hit an asteroid. This won't destroy the space rock, but it will alter its course. And our models suggest that it's going to change the orbit by a little bit, but even a little bit is enough to matter. And the NASA mission did just that. In September 2022, the DART spacecraft successfully hit an asteroid and changed its course forever. But protecting the Earth from thousands of asteroids is no easy ask. NASA knows they can't do it alone. They've partnered with India's ISRO for asteroid protection. Japan, too, has joined hands. China and Russia are working on asteroid deflection missions. While there are plenty of divisions on the ground, and in space, too, at least when it comes to protecting the Earth from asteroids, there is some unity among countries. So don't worry and sleep peacefully. The world's space scientists are keeping vigil.
And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Florida, a small plane crashed into a mobile home park, killing three people. In Australia, a three-year-old boy got stuck inside a toy's claw machine. He was happily playing with the toys and was later rescued. Meanwhile, Puppy Bowl turned 20 this year. This is a dog version of the American Super Bowl. And finally, taking you back in history, on the 2nd, 2nd of February, 1971, Idi Amin declared himself president of Uganda, the East African nation. His regime lasted eight years. He was nicknamed Butcher of Uganda for his brutality. We're leaving you with that. Thanks for watching. Have a good weekend. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Pulse America.